but we're mindful. I want to take a look here at this chart because it's an important opportunity to message something that I'll be talking a lot about this week. Here's the reality of where we are, and this is more important perhaps to people than anything that I've just stated. Where are we? Where are we going? And when is this thing behind us? Now, no one can answer the latter part of that. Uh, as we know, we've all been humbled by this pandemic. But here are the difficult and challenging realities. For all the success California's had uh, compared to large states, peer states, uh, here's where we are in total number of cases. You could see one year ago, just shy of 60,000 cases, over 100, just shy of 103,000 reporting. This is from yesterday, but reported today. Here's the part of this slide that I want you to focus on, and that's total hospital census. We're almost, and we anticipate, by the 14th or 15th, just in the next few days this week, that we'll be at a higher total hospitalization census than we were at the peak of this pandemic early last year. But also note, not all of them are COVID patients. 22,000 last year, 11,000 that we reported today are COVID positive. Now, we anticipate the COVID positive numbers to rise. Why? For every, and here's the latest number, and these numbers change. This is not about inconsistency. It's about the nature of a pandemic and a disease. As of this weekend, our current data suggests that we have roughly four and a half folks, every hundred, that get, uh, or rather, four and a half percent of people that get the Omicron variant. Four and a half percent end up hospitalized. The average length of stay is 3.6 days. Two things to note on those numbers. The four and a half percent is lower than the Delta by a significant margin. And the number of days hospitalized is more modest, so less days than with previous uh, viruses. So while the numbers may be percentage-wise smaller, the totality of those getting this variant are such that it's going to put tremendous strain on our hospital system. It's not unique to California. We currently have 2,250 contracted workers to supplement our staff. We're hoping to get another 1,250 in the next three weeks to supplement staffing in many of our hospitals and notably in our emergency departments. Take a look at those emergency department visits. You see that number substantially greater. That's where tremendous stress is currently play, being placed as it relates uh, to our EDs. And so we have work to do. You referenced some changes we just made. They're very consistent and I hope you'll go back and take a look uh, to avail yourself more understanding of some previous orders we put back that allowed for the flexibility that we just allowed for as it relates to health workers. Uh, and so we extended uh, that same flexibility as we had done in the past in order to address the stress on the system. It's called dealing with reality. The pragmatism, not what you want, but what you need to do at a time of challenge and constraints and scarcity as it relates to resources and resources we're competing with across the country. So we've done that by providing 200 more National Guards men and women at our Optum Turf sites. We've extended the hours of operation. We've averaged just shy of 600,000 tests a day, just over example of the last three days, just as an example. We're proud of that. Proud of the partnerships with our own lab, Valencia Lab, doing 60 to 80,000 tests a day. Proud of the pre-existing work we do with the schools, with PCR tests. As you know, proud of this, that we have submitted over a billion units of PPE to schools and communities, including N95 masks over the course of the last week or so, uh, to specifically six county uh, offices, tens of thousands of N95 masks on demand as needed, those N95s will be delivered to our schools so we can provide even more additional protections. Many moving parts uh, to address this surge uh, over the course of the next uh, few weeks. And let me just preview, it's not on this slide, much of what I've said is not on this slide, uh, but this slide will give you a sense of where we are today. We are projecting on the, uh, depending on 
which chart and projection and modeling, and again, this is art, not science, uh, that our COVID census, you see at 11,048 uh, today, that census may increase by February 2nd to as high as 23,000, uh, which would be above the hospitalized census peak from last January. And I believe that was um, uh, the census peak last January was around the second or third week of January. So it gives you a sense of where we are. Uh, it's manageable, but it's challenging, it's difficult, and none more challenged than, uh, than our frontline employees and these nurses and doctors that have just been overwhelmed. And, uh, you know, I know you, we say it, but you can't say it enough. Um, you know, they could dial it in. Many can't come in to work because they themselves are getting sick, but boy, do they deserve an expression of gratitude. And that's why, and forgive me, that's why I wanna add this to multiplicity of issues we brought up. Uh, we are in discussions with legislative leaders around our sick leave policy. And we believe it's important to value those workers and provide them sick leave protections. But for those that are asymptomatic, to your question, similar to what we've done in the past, we wanted to provide flexibility. And I think that's consistent with past policies and practice. Uh, but I will say this, when it comes to a pandemic, um, I think one has to be uh, very, very flexible on the basis of changing environment and changing conditions. And the worst thing you can be is ideological uh, in order to run linear through a pandemic when in fact new conditions and challenges present themselves every hour, not just every day.